Welcome to today's Bible teaching with Pastor Mike Bernard of Shoreline Community Church in North Bend, Oregon. We hope you will be blessed as we explore the riches of God's Word verse by verse. Please open your Bible and join us for today's message. Here's Pastor Mike. I've got to tell you, this is really special for me because when I moved to the area in 1996, uh, I met both of these young people. And back in those days, Amarelle was the same age as Jesse. She was eight years old. So I've known Amarelle since she was eight, and I've known Tyler since he was a little bit older than that. And today we get to dedicate the, the children here. So we got Finley coming up here. we got the family. <laughs> Great to see you guys. And I'm glad that you're able to come up, Nelson, Jenny, and, and the family here. All right. Well, we've got here Finley. Can you be five? All right. And we've got little Adrian. I call him Rogers because he's going to be a preacher, right? <laughs> In the future. <laughs> so Tyler and Amarel have come and they've asked if we would go ahead and, and do that child dedication. And in Matthew chapter 19, verse 14, Jesus said to let the little children t come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And one of the things we do here at Shoreline, we don't do child baptisms, but we do do child dedications. And so we dedicate, uh, we'll spend a little bit of time dedicating the children to the Lord, and we'll spend a little bit of time dedicating the parents and the family, and then also the church congregation as well. But uh, for, for the the, the baptisms, one of the reasons we don't do them here is because the children don't understand and really that baptism is the faith of the parents that go through that uh, infant christening. So we do a child dedication and then as the kids get older they come to faith in Jesus Christ then we go ahead and we do the baptisms for them at that time. Now we've got a couple of little guys to meet here and the very first one here is Finley. I got to tell you Finley, you want to stand up for a minute? No you're fine right there. You, <laughs> you're sitting down here hiding. From the time that he was one week old he has spent just about every week here here at the church working. He's here at 7 in the morning. He works all day long. Uh, I've even seen you back here on the drums a couple of times, haven't you? <laughs> so he's been here. Uh, how old are you now, Finley? Five years old. Five, you know, five years old, okay. And then we've got Adrian. Adrian, how old are you? Uh. He's not going to answer yet. <laughs> how old is Adrian? A month. One month old. All right. What, what is special, extra special about these two kids? I'm going to put Tyler on the spot here. <laughs> they look like me. They look like him. <laughs> All right. Amaral, what would you say? <laughs> that God blessed us with two sons. That God blessed you with two sons, which is very, very special. And I know, I know for Adrian, it was a prayer of yours for a long time, and God answered, and it's out of Psalm 139. And I've got the wrong glasses, so if I read like this, forgive me. It's my preaching glasses. <laughs> so uh, Psalm 139 be, uh, begins with verse 13. It says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me, Finley and Adrian, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Isn't that special? God had a plan for both of these young men even before they were born. So Finley, I think I'm going to get you to stand up so I can pray with you. Would you do that? He's all right. He's going to get up. <laughs> all right. Do you mind if I hold the baby here? Oh, Adrian. She might not get him back. <laughs> all right. Well, let's just pray here and... Uh, Lord, I thank you so much for these dear children, for Finley, who's grown up here in this church just about every week from the time he was a week old, and even for Adrian, from the time that he's one week old, he's been here as well. And I just want to want to lift up both of these children. I pray that they would come to faith in Christ. I pray, Lord, that they would live their lives dedicated to you. And so, Lord, in this prayer dedication today, we, we dedicate Finley and we dedicate Adrian to you and just ask that you would do a fantastic work in 
their hearts and their lives and use them greatly for your kingdom. And then, Lord, we pray also for, for Tyler and Amarell as the parents and just want to thank you for, for them and for their love for you, for their desire to raise their children in a way that would be pleasing to you and, and their desire to see their children come to faith. And, and Lord, for Nelson and Jenny and the entire family as they're here, I know they're, they're giving support uh, spiritually to this family as well. And so we just would pray for them, Lord, in the raising up of these boys, that you would guide them and direct them so they can give them the kind of godly training that you said. You said that if we train up a child in the way that he should go when he is old, he will not part from it. And then, Lord, I also want to pray for our church congregation today that as we gather around them as a church family, that we would give them the support in Sunday school and Mission 119 and all the ministries that we have going throughout this church all week long. Lord, that we would be here to keep the doors open and to help them in the raising up of their children in the ways of the Lord. So we thank you, Lord, for, for both, both of these children, for Finley, for Adrian, and we ask, Lord, for your blessing to be upon them throughout their life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you want to open up your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 28, and we're going to go ahead and start with that in just a moment. And Father, I thank you once again uh, for who you are. Lord, you are a great and an awesome God, a God who changes lives. And I pray today that we just, we might become like Jesus. That would be my desire as we grow in our knowledge and our love of you. And so we just pray for you to be with us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the title of the message today is Do Not Quench the Holy Spirit. And we're going to be taking a look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 28. And before I do, this will be the last in the series that we've been doing on, on the book of 1 Thessalonians. And then after the Christmas break, I'm going to go ahead and pick up 2 Thessalonians as we get into the Antichrist and look at all the end time type stuff that goes along with this. But this particular book, the book of First Thessalonians, uh, is eschatological in nature. And I asked how many of you guys knew what that word eschatology means, and the majority of the hands went up last week. But what eschatology means is the study of the end times. And so First Thessalonians is eschatological in nature. It deals with the coming wrath. It deals with the return of Jesus Christ. It deals with the rapture of the church. And then last week we took a look, it deals with the coming day of the Lord. And so we've got all of these different issues, but some people would look at this book as well and they say, look, this isn't just a book on eschatology or a book on the end times. This is a book that's really a pastoral epistle because this book has a lot of instructions to help us in our everyday life. And that's kind of where we're going to pick it up because as we come to chapter 5, what we find is that Paul ends this book with a series of teaching bullets or practical applications for you and me as we live our everyday lives. And uh, he leaves with a series of instructions to encourage the Thessalonians to press on toward a godly life. And that should be a story for you and for me as well. That should be our goal as that we want to get to the point in which we too are living a godly life. So I want to pick up the story right now in verse 12. And it begins with this. It says, And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and who are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Paul uses that word brethren a lot. I mean, we don't say it too often. Today, we're, we're more likely in church to say, hey brother, or hey sister, how you doing? Uh, but quite often you'll see in the Bible that they use that word brethren. And Paul ended up using it 27 times in the two books to the Thessalonians. So it was a significant term that he was using. And he's saying, we urge you brethren to recognize those who labor among you and who are over you in the Lord and admonish you. You see, it appears that there was an issue here that uh, there were those within the church that had become a little bit unruly. And we're going to find out in a moment, you know, what that issue was that was becoming unruly. But those who labor over you would be the elders of the church and uh, uh, the spiritual leaders of the Thessalonian church. And that they were to admonish you. And the question is, what is admonish? Well, to admonish means to warn. It means to reprove or to correct mildly. It means to exhort. That means to give urgent advice. Something is, is very important. And apparently what had happened in the church of Thessalonica is that there were some people there that refused to submit to the church leadership. 
It's interesting that today submission has become a bad word in our culture. Have you noticed that? You start talking about anybody submitting in our culture and you're going to have a little bit of a war that's going on in the background because people don't want to do it. They, they want to be in charge of their lives. You know, uh, why is it important for us to submit? Because Jesus submitted to the Father. It's important to us to submit because we've been commanded to submit. Well, as they did in the church of Thessalonica, the elders play a vital role in every local church. In fact, that word elder can mean your age. I was on a board one time where one of the elders would always refer to the elders as the old guys. And, and the question is, why would you have elders that, that are on a board with that particular name? Why would they look for people who are older? And I think the reason is because, and it doesn't have to be confined to people who are older, but I think the idea here is the people with the gray hair, the people who have been around for a while have been around the block a few times and they've got a little bit of experience. Rather than just reading in a textbook how you should react or what should happen when a crisis happens in your life, They've been through the crisis. They've been able to find out how to get through that, come out on the other side so that you can exhort, you can encourage others to walk consistently with the Lord. And I think here it really speaks of the spiritual maturity of the individual who's holding the office. The apostle Peter was an elder and he gave instructions to his fellow elders as to how they should act in 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 1 through 5. Peter wrote this. He said, the elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as lords over those entrusted to you, but as examples to the flock." And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Well, what's going on in the church? Why are they having difficulties? And Paul is addressing this particular issue. Many people believe that what had happened is, is with that whole eschatological theme, with that whole concept and the belief of the imminent return of Jesus Christ, that many of the believers there in Thessalonica said, hey, Christ is coming back at any time. Why would I have to work? Why not just quit my job right now? I'm going to wait and I'm going to go ahead, if I have money, I'm going to go to the church. They got money. I'm going to have them support me. Or maybe there's other people within the church that would be willing to support me as well. And that became a major issue, and we're going to see that later on as it plays out once again. And I think maybe that's something that Paul was dealing with. Well, one of the roles of church elders is, is to be a shepherd. And what do the shepherds do? They shepherd the flock. They, they build up the body of Christ. We see in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 12, when Paul says this, he says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. By the way, today if you walk into a church, usually people are looking for the pastor. They want that, that pastor as the head person of the church. Do you realize the word elder or elders is in the Bible over 200 times, but the word pastor is not in the word of God at all? Pastors is in the word of God one time, and it has to do with the function. Of, of what that shepherd would do. And I think it's interesting that today we've switched everything over where the head person is the pastor. When in reality what you find in the scriptures is a plurality of elders who, who, who work in the church and, and minister in that church. Well, it says, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints, to the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. To a perfect man, to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Jesus Christ. Well, Paul continues in verse 13. And he says, to esteem them. What does that mean? It means to respect them. To esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourself. 
The fact that Paul brings that up at the end, to be at peace among yourselves, seems to indicate that maybe there wasn't peace. Maybe there was some conflict that was going on within the body at that particular time, some, some tensions that were there. But in, in, in that case, he's telling me, you need to respect your elders. And I'll tell you, even if there's a particular elder that they didn't respect, they should have at least respected the position, realizing that the elders of the church are going to be held far more accountable than the average congregation members. And when that judgment day comes, elders are going to have to stand before the Lord and answer for the way that they ministered or they didn't minister to their church body. And so there's a lot of accountability and, and, and challenges that are there that the congregation doesn't have to go through. It's not uncommon to find tensions in any local church. How many of you have ever been in a church in which there's never, ever, ever been any kind of attention at all? You know, attention that's going on. If, if you've been there for a while, there's going to be some disagreement because whenever you bring people into the church, there's going to be disagreements. I've once heard it said church would be great if it wasn't for the people. <laughs> but church is the people. So William McDonald says the number one problem among Christians everywhere is the problem of getting along with each other. Every believer has enough of the flesh in him to divide or wreck any local church. Only as empowered by the Spirit can we develop the love, brokenness, forbearance, kindness, tenderness, tenderheartedness, I should say, and forgiveness that are indispensable for peace. You see, that danger of the self rising to the top and the disunity coming into the body is a danger that every single church faces. And time and time again, churches are divided over that kind of disunity. I want you to think of denominations because it's not just local churches. It's denominations as well. I mean, it starts off with one or two denominations. Uh, back in the Reformation, you got just a few of them. Today, we got thousands and thousands of denominations. And every time uh, disunity comes up within, it seems like another branch ends up going somewhere else. And we see uh, the church splitting all over the place. But division within the church is so contrary to the high priestly prayer of Jesus and what Jesus desired for the church on the night before his crucifixion. In John chapter 17 verses 20 through 21, Jesus said this, he said, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me. Man, has the church ever fallen away and fallen short on that particular one? What happens when we don't have that unity? What happens when there's division that takes place within the church? Well, number one, it smears the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't it? I mean, these people are followers of Jesus. They're telling everybody that. But can they love one another as they love the Lord? And it kills the testimony of the church. Oh, that church, they're, uh, yeah, those people over there, they're, they're, they're nasty. Those people are nasty. They're fighting all the time. What's that do to the church? And Jesus prayed that we would be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. Why? That the world may believe that you sent me. Well, Paul taught the church leaders are to be held in high esteem, and apparently that wasn't happening in Thessalonica. There were some issues that were going on, but they were to be held in high esteem because of the nature of their work. You see, being a, a, a church leader is not an easy task. Anytime you stick your head above the crowd, somebody's going to take a shot at it. And I'll tell you what, I've told you so many times in here before, uh, when we come to, to Christ, you hear people t say, all you got to do is come to Christ and everything's going to be fantastic the rest of your life. Everything's going to be easy. And I say, no way. When you come to Christ, you have declared war against somebody. Who is that somebody? Satan. And he's ticked off at you. And he's going to do everything that he can to bring you down. In fact, any time you step up spiritually to a new role in ministry that you've never done before, you can expect to get clobbered because he's going to come after you to discourage you and stop you from being all that you can be in Christ. And you just have to make up your mind that no matter what happens, I'm going forward anyways because I can't stand what he's doing. I can't stand who he is, but I love Jesus and I'm going to follow Jesus no matter what. I am not going to let him win. And we need to understand that those attacks are going to come anytime we step up. Now, we're talking Christian leaders. If you think you're getting clobbered 
What do you think the Christian leaders and their families are like? He's going to go and do everything that he can to destroy your reputation, to bring you down, to stop you from ministering, because if he can do that, then he wins. It's so important, ladies and gentlemen, that we not only pray for you, but that you pray for us, knowing that we're under terrible attack from the enemy. He's trying everything he can do to stop ministry at all times. Well, as verse 14 continues, Paul says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient to all. He gives church leaders four instructions. The instructions that he gives to them are, are to warn those who are unruly. And in this particular case, it probably means that they're idle. They're not working. To comfort the faint-hearted, to uphold the weak, and then to be patient with all. Well, what did he mean by to warn the unruly? And I think, and who were these individuals? Well, once again, I think these were probably the individuals who had quit their jobs because of the imminent return of Jesus Christ. And they're saying, okay, we're going to kick back here, and uh, we're just going to trust Jesus is coming at any moment, and whatever we fall short, you guys, the church, can go ahead and help provide for our needs, which really gave Paul a lot of heartburn. He was a person who went out and worked hard himself to set the example. And we get a glimpse of this that even, even after he's writing them this in 1 Thessalonians, it doesn't go away. He's writing them now in 51 AD, okay? When he writes 2 Thessalonians, it's later in 51 AD or it's in 52 AD, we find out that the same problem is still going on. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 9, Paul wrote this. He said, we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you, that you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked and labored and toiled day and night, that we might be a burden, might not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves as an example of how you should follow. Paul's saying, look, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. I have every right to receive support from you, but I want it. I want to set the example for you to show you that as Christians, we need to be hard-working people. We need to be out there earning our own money so that not only can we pay for our own bills, but maybe we've got a little left over to help other people who are in need. And we set that example. And I've got to tell you, it's the same for us today. I firmly believe that Christians ought to be the best workers in any organization. We're not working for that boss that's given us trouble. The one that we're working for is Jesus Christ. We are employees, if you would, of Jesus Christ. Would you cheat from Jesus? You know, would you steal from Jesus on time or whatever it might be while you're working? Or would you give it 110% if you realize that you are working for your Savior? And I think that's the, the focus that we need to have is that whatever we do, uh, if we are an employer, we, we are an employee of Jesus Christ and we represent him even while we're at work. Well, Paul was so upset about this in Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. He says this, for even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in, dis in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but they're busy bodies. What happens when people are idle? When they get idle, that's when we get into trouble, isn't it? When there's nothing to do, that's when we get into trouble. And he says that they're not working at all. They're, they're idle, but they're busy bodies. Now those who are such we command and we exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and they eat their own bread. The thing I love about Paul is he comes and he deals with the issues head on. Well, I think it's important for us to remember once again that church leaders, uh, church leaders are to meet people where they're at. Sometimes that's the hard part, isn't it? Because when, when people come to church, they're from all over the place, and they don't come cloned as Christians. We have brand new Christians that you've got to reach, and you've got to help disciple and develop them in the body of Christ, and even at that, every single person's going to be different. Every single person's going to have different spiritual gifts. What Paul says here, first instruction to him is, 
is that you're to warn those who are unruly, those who are idle. And if they're having a hard time with the, the, the leaders of the church or the elders challenging them with that, at this point, that's why the warning. That's, that's why he's getting a little bit tough. He's, he's got to get strong on them that they need to go back to work and stop taking from the other believers who are helping them. Number two, to comfort the faint-hearted. Uh, what does it mean by faint-hearted? I, I think that it might be those individuals who are spiritually worn out. Those, those individuals who have gone through stuff and they need some encouragement. They are wiped out. And we're to comfort the faint-hearted. We're to uphold the weak. Well, leaders are to help those who are injured. It could be injured physically. It could be injured spiritually. But something has weakened them. And as the body of Christ, we're to come along and we're to uphold those people. And the last part here is to be patient with all. Once again, is where we meet people right where they're at in life. And and they come in the church and so many people come and they don't have a clue of who Jesus is. Everybody wants them all of a sudden to live like Christ. No, I'm thrilled that they're here. You want them to come in. You want them to hear the word. It's the word of God that changes people from the inside out. Amen? And, we, and, and the love of God's people reaching out to them. I've got to tell you, my hope is that nobody walks into this church and leaves without at least five people greeting that person. And we have no official greeting program here. It's just natural what happens. And uh, I'll tell you, when I see people walking around greeting people in the church, greeting people outside, uh, that's so awesome. You know, everybody's doing what they want to do because they want to do it. Well, verse 15 continues and says, see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourself and for all. If you guys ever heard the saying, I don't get mad, I get what? I get even. You've, you've heard it. That was you. That came from you, huh? Yeah. Well, retaliation's not an option for the Christian. In fact, um, it would be a surprise, I'm sure, to the Jewish hearers that uh, heard what Paul had to, to say there. Because in the Old Testament, it was very simple. An eye for an eye. And a tooth for a tooth. If there's going to be something done to me, I'm going to get you back. But many of the Jewish believers must have been surprised by those teachings of Jesus because they, they were so contrary to that. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 through 39, Jesus said this. He said, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other cheek to him also. Does that mean if somebody is pounding on you, you just got to stop and let that individual pound on you? I'm going to pick on Doug for a minute. Doug, would you stand up for a minute, please? You are going to become an illustration, or I am going to become an illustration. (laughs) Okay. Uh, how's, How's that read? It says, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other one to him also. Okay, I'm right-handed. The majority of people are right-handed. If you get mad at me, he's looking at me like, don't hit me. <laughs> if, 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 if I get mad at you and we end up getting a fight, I'm going to probably use my right hand. I'm going to get you... Re- what cheek did I just get you on? My left. I got you on your left cheek. What's Jesus say? Your right cheek. Mm-hmm. What's the right cheek? It's an insult. It's a slap in the face. It's not saying self-defense. Uh, what it is is somebody insults you. Turn your other cheek. Let them insult you on that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't hit me. I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. So Jesus is saying it's, it's an insult. You know, don't, just, don't worry about it. If they insult you, just turn the other cheek. Let them, let them do it. Instead of getting angry, instead of losing a lot of sleep over an individual, you know, it's giving you a hard time, put the person in God's hands. Let God deal with them. Who's better to deal with a person than God? Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 19, Paul said, repay, evil, repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for, for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all men. That verse is so important because sometimes we want to bring healing. We want to bring reconciliation with individuals and they won't reconcile with us. What's the Bible say? It says, if it is possible, as much as it depends upon who? As much as it depends upon you. 
live peaceably with all men. And if you ever get to that point where reconciliation can happen, always be willing to do that. Always be willing to come to that point of reconciliation. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Verses 20 through 21 continue. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not become, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In other words, you, you say, man, you don't understand the person that I am dealing with. You don't understand how poorly they've treated me, how badly they've treated me. I can't stand them. And I say, I may not understand, but I know one who does. And the one who does is Jesus Christ. And the ultimate example that we should follow when it comes to suffering is that of Jesus. First Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 24, uh, Peter says this, he says, for, for to this you are called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he was spoken abusively against, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body in the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed." You want to take a look at somebody who suffered and really didn't have any reason, excuse, for those people abusing him the way that he was. It was Jesus. And when he was spoken abusively against, he didn't respond. Think of the marriage relationship. He didn't respond at that point. He didn't respond in an angry way. Uh, but Jesus went to that cross. He died for our sins so that we might be forgiven by his wounds. I used to really be upset if people got upset at me. You know, I mean, I, I, it used to really bother me. I, I, I wanted people to like me. I wanted to please everybody. But over the years, I found out it doesn't work that way. And sometimes things don't even have to make sense for, for them to happen. And what we really need to be con concerned about today as believers in Jesus Christ is what does God think? What does he think of our actions and how we're responding and, and, and go that direction? Because it doesn't really matter whether other people like the fact or not that we're walking with Jesus. We, we need to walk with Jesus. As Christians, we should be a sense, uh, especially quick to forgive when somebody has wronged us, remembering that God in Christ forgave us. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32, it says, it says this, it says, get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and slander um, uh, along with every form of malice. Have you ever noticed that when you don't forgive, when that anger is building up, yeah, it affects other people. But the person that it affects the most is you. And it's really important that we can give up that anger. Get rid of all bitterness. You know, a person who's bitter is like having a hot coal in your hand thinking it's going to burn the other person. You're the one who gets burned. You know, the bitterness and the rage and the anger and the brawling and the slander, along with every form of malice, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. And then we see in Colossians chapter 3, verses 13 through 14, bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. One of the most incredible examples that I've seen in my life of forgiveness came from my wife. There was an individual who was very close to her as a child, uh, who sexually abused her. And for years, she struggled with that. It affected us in our marriage for, for, for a season. And I'll tell you, every time I saw this individual, I just wanted to, I wanted to punch him. I, I just knew what he had done to my wife, and I did not like it. And one day, we're all together, and my wife walked up to me, and she said, uh, Mike, God has told me that I need to forgive this individual. I was stunned. I thought, I want to hit him, and you want to forgive him? God has told me, and I need to do it. I watched her watch up to the, walk up to this individual who was a big bear of a man, and she told the individual, she looked him in the eyes, and she said, I forgive you. 
Do you know how that guy reacted? This big bear of a guy all of a sudden broke down in tears and he started to cry because he had been holding that guilt for all of his life as well. And today the two of them have come to the point now where, where, where they're, they're good friends, best friends with each other, having let the water go under the bridge from what happened in the past, because when you don't, you're the one who has to carry that. Give it to God. Let God deal with it. And we've seen, I guess you could say, we've seen a miracle here in this case in which healing and reconciliation took place. Uh, and I couldn't believe that she walked and said, God told me I have to do this. And she did it. And healing came. Well, verse 16 continues and it says, Rejoice always. The two words here, rejoice always, in the Greek New Testament, it's the shortest verse in the entire Greek New, New Testament. In the English one, it's Jesus wept. But here it's the shortest in the Greek. But have you noticed that there's a difference between happiness and joy? We get happy when somebody all of a sudden comes up and says, you just won one million dollars. Hey, we're happy, right? It's, it's the feeling within us that things are going good and we're happy. And it's dependent upon the circumstances that we're in at any given time. But I think joy goes a little bit deeper than that. In fact, it goes much deeper than that. Joy doesn't really depend upon your circumstances. What joy depends upon is our position in Jesus Christ, that we are born again, that we are saved, that no matter what the enemy throws at us, in the end we win. And, 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 and we look and we see the blessings that, that Christ has for us. We've got the best retirement plan out there. Do you guys realize that? Isn't that cool? But even in spite of the circumstances we go through, that there is joy well, Paul says in, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do you think, wow, you know, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident. The Lord is near. Do you think if we really believe that Jesus were coming back this afternoon that we would act a little bit differently? Do you think our day we might have a few things happening that wouldn't have happened otherwise if we really didn't believe that the Lord Jesus was returning? Well, verse 17 continues. It says, pray without ceasing. Well, how in the world do I do that? Don't I have to go to work? Don't I have to sleep? How do I pray without ceasing? Does that mean I'm praying 24-7? No. I love the definition that Charles Spurgeon gives us on this. Spurgeon says, to pray without ceasing means to live in an atmosphere of prayer. What does that mean? You are so in tune with the Holy Spirit as you walk with him that any time of the day you can be firing up prayer requests back and forth. Something happens, you pray immediately. You're in that atmosphere of prayer where you're ready to pray at all times. Verse 18 continues, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Let me ask you this. Are you one of those people? Some people always see the cup half empty. Other people always see the cup half full. What kind of a person are you? Do you always come along uh, negative, looking at everything, thinking that there's something wrong with this? Or do you see that, hey, that cup's half full and God's going to go ahead and bless. He's at, he's at work in my life and I'm going to thank him. Well, the Bible says that in everything, give thanks. And as Christians, we should be the most thankful and appreciative people that are out there. Why? Because in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, Paul said this, he said, and we know that in all things, God works together, or the, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. That no matter what it is that we're going through in our life right now, it's not a surprise to God. God's fully aware of what we're going through. He's working in us. And he's promised for those who know him, for those who loved him, for those who are the called, that he is at work in our lives. You ready for this? As difficult as the things we're going through, conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ. And sometimes that can be hard, can it? But that's where we need to get. I had a situation many years ago. Uh, it was a church in Fremont, California. In fact, it was Fremont Community Church years ago. I was the Iwana commander there. And uh, the pastor that we had at the time, 
uh, not only was I, gosh, I was volunteer probably 30 hours a week working for Awana at that, that time, but I was being personally discipled by the pastor. And every week we would meet, we'd come together. He was promising me, he said, Mike, you know, we got this children's pastor position that's kind of, uh, going to be opening, and, and we're lining you right up for this position. And so I would be volunteering, and I would have done that anyways, but volunteering all of these hours, coming and meeting with him. One day, the individual who was in that position went ahead and called all the children's ministry workers out for lunch. So that's cool. So we all go out to lunch, and we're sitting around the table, and he, he gave the announcement that a new children's pastor had been hired, and he was a book writer. And I, everyone at that table knew where I was at, and they all looked at me, and I just wanted to crawl under that table. I went home and I cried. And I thought, how in the world could God ever allow something like this to happen? Well, suddenly, without anyone knowing what was coming, the pastor resigned. And a new pastor ended up coming in. And he cleared out all of the staff members, in fact, so bad that even the music pastor, he wouldn't even let him go back into his office to clean the things out. And uh, for myself, in an Awana meeting, he looked at me and he said, you offend me. And I knew I'd been done. And so I ended up leaving. And I thought, all of those years, all of those hours. Well, it wasn't much longer after that. I ended up going over to another church in town, which was called Evangelical Free Church. And at that particular church, the director of children's ministries was, was Ruth Gunther, who became a good friend of mine. And one day Ruth came to me and she said, Mike, I've got a friend up in Oregon who has an opening in their church and it sounds just like you. And so I went ahead and I put in the application and it wasn't very long and I got called up to that, that church into a position that could have, uh, I, if, I, if I had been on staff at that church when that pastoral change happened, I would have been fired. What kind of a chance would I ever have had of getting back into another ministry? And sometimes you see things that don't make sense as you're going through them, but as you go down the road, you can see that God's at work, even in the difficult times, and he's bringing you to that position right where you need to be. Amen? Well, do you know what God's will is for your life? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 17 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Well, if you if you don't, you might want. If you don't, you might want to. You might end up quenching the Holy Spirit in your life. In fact, verse 19 says, "Do not quench the Spirit." In other words, if you're going to quench the Spirit, the idea is having a bucket of water and you throw it on a fire and you end up putting that fire out. Well, sometimes our doubts and our unbelief will stifle the work of God that's going on in our life. William McDonald says this. He says, to quench the spirit means to stifle his work in our midst, to limit and hinder him. Sin quenches the spirit. Traditions quench him. Man-made rules and regulations and public worship quench him. Disunity quenches him. There's a lot of things that quench the spirit. And one of the things that quenches the spirit is a lack of willingness to do what the Spirit is leading you to do. I think I saw this clearest in my life. One day I was called several years ago up to Bay Area Hospital. There was a dying man. I went up with his family and uh, sat around and I visited with this man for, for quite a long time and with his family and we ended up praying together. It was the end of a busy day. Five o'clock had already come. I knew uh, my wife had the dinner on and I uh, started heading towards home to go in that direction. And I got to tell you, I'm not the kind of person that I hear a voice from God, you know, that God tells me something and I hear the voice. But I'm driving home from the hospital and I hear the words, go back and give the gospel. I thought he was a Christian. We just sat there. I, I just prayed with him. Go back and give the gospel. It's late. I got this to do. I got that to do. I'll go back in the morning. And I went home and I ate dinner and I went back in the morning. You guessed it. He was dead. You know, so was that the voice of, of God? I don't, you know, we, when, when we feel a leading, a strong leading from the Holy Spirit, stop what you're doing and do it right then. Even if it's an uncomfortable time, even if it doesn't seem to be the right time to do it. 
verse 20. Do not despise prophets, the prophecies. I think it's important for us to remember that the New Testament was still being written at this point. This is 51 AD. It's one of the earliest books in the, in the New Testament. But Paul talk, talked about the same thing when it came to prophecy with the Romans. He said this in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 6. He said, heaven then given different, uh, different gifts according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. And Paul lists the rest of the gifts and he's saying, look, if God gave you a gift, then you use it. Well, in the context, what appears was happening here is the God was given the Thessalonians prophecies and they weren't receiving them. They were looking down on them. Perhaps this is what was meant by them quenching the spirit. Today we see prophecy primarily in two ways in the scripture. First of all, what we see is, is prophecy being used in foretelling. That's speaking about talking about future events, way in the future, foretelling the future. We don't see as much of that happening today as happened back in biblical days. Secondly is foretelling. Foretelling would be powerfully proclaiming the written word of God. And today we would call that preaching where some, some individuals have that gift of prophecy as they take the word of God and as they're preaching it in a very powerful way in which people are convicted and they can understand the truth of God's word. But we need to understand that Paul's not telling the Thessalonians just to blindly accept anything that they hear. Verse 21, he's saying, test all things. Hold fast to what's good. As Christians, we should evaluate everything that we hear from the canon of scripture. And when I say the cannon, I'm not saying that, that, uh, that weapon that goes boom. The cannon means the measuring rod. That's what it means. We're to test everything from the measuring rod of Scripture. That the Scriptures and the Scriptures alone are the authority for what we believe. Amen? The Scriptures are our manual for life. The scriptures are God's love letter to you and me, how to live our lives in the best way in which he will bless us. Well, as we continue in, in evaluating how the Christians should live their lives, Paul says, abstain from every form of evil. Have you noticed how much evil is out there in the world today? I mean, everywhere we look, it's like, my goodness, everything, right is wrong, wrong is right, everything seems to be all twisted around. And we may have to live in the world, but we don't have to be of the world, do we? And in fact, we should do the best that we can to honor the Lord with the way in which we live our lives every day. But in this particular case, what may have been going on, he's, he's saying abstain from every form of evil. It may refer to false prophecies or to false teaching. He's saying, be careful from these, these different things. Verse 23, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one way for you and me to have peace with God. And that one way is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, or proved, re declared righteous, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't have peace today, the one way that you can get peace for all eternity is to get peace with God by grace through faith in Jesus Christ as we put our trust and our faith in him. All right. Verse 23 continues, notice Paul says, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of people like to argue whether there's a tripartite or a bipartite part of the body, whether the bipartite is body and soul, or whether the person is tripartite, body, soul, and spirit. I don't think right now it's even worth arguing over that, but, but what I would say is that Paul's prayer here is that every, every aspect of the believer's life would be sanctified in preparation for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants us to be ready when Christ comes. We see two kinds of sanctification in the Word of God. Number one is positional sanctification. What does that mean? Do you realize that the moment that you came to faith in Jesus Christ, that at that very moment you were born again, you are regenerate. You are a new creation in Christ. And positionally in Jesus Christ, you are sanctified. That means you are set apart for him. 
But we see a second kind of sanctification in the scripture as well. And that's what we call progressive or practical sanctification. From the moment that you're born again, from that moment on through the rest of your life until the Lord returns or until you end up dying and going to him, we are in something which is called the sanctification process. And that means that we're growing in the Lord. We're becoming conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And hopefully with every day we're becoming more and more like Christ. So we have these two kinds of sanctification, which mean to be set apart and specifically to be set apart for Christ happening in our life. Well, why is it important for us to be preserved blameless at the coming of Christ? I think that's very similar. We're coming to the end of the letter here. Well, why is it important for us to be preserved in sanctification for that coming? Well, we're to be preserved blameless because we need to be ready when Christ appears. Can you imagine what it would be like to be out there living in a life of sin and all of a sudden you realize, here's the Lord. He's, he's come on this very day and he's caught you right in the middle of, of whatever it is that, that you're doing. Well, blameless in, in the American Heritage Dictionary is defined like this. It says, free from blame or guilt or innocent. And although we fall into sin, and each and every one of us does at different times in our life, it's important for us not to be in that lifestyle of sin, you know, to get out of it. That's where we end up running into trouble. When we do sin, we do get into trouble. What do we do? First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Well, as we see this word here, uh, the coming, that's the Greek word parousia, which has to do with the coming or the second coming coming of Jesus Christ. And it's the fourth time in this epistle that we see it. We've seen it in chapter 2, verse 19. We've seen it in chapter 3, verse 13, chapter 4, verse 15, and chapter 5, verse 23. But I think the main point here is that each and every one of us, we need to be ready to meet Jesus when he comes. And that's what we should be working to, towards because he is coming. We look at the timing of all of this and we say, man, it's been over 2,000 years, 20 centuries. Where's Jesus? Well, the fact of the matter is, is a day with the Lord is like a 1,000 years. And a 1,000 years is like a day. But the truth is the Bible says that the return of Jesus Christ could be imminent. It could be before this service is over over even today. Verse 24, he who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. This return uh, refers to God's effectual call. Aren't you glad that our salvation depends upon the faithfulness of God and not the way that we feel at any given moment? I mean, do you guys go through ups and downs in your life? Sometimes you feel really spiritually in tune. Other times you feel drained. You know, aren't you glad that, that where we're at with God, our salvation, isn't dependent upon how you feel at any given moment. It's dependent upon the finished work of Jesus Christ. And we can put our trust in, in, in him and in that. Salvation is of the Lord. And it's the only way that you and I can have an assurance of salvation. You ever struggle with your, your spiritual walk at all? I have at different times. Verses like Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 are, are so important. Being confident of this very thing. That he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He began it in you. He's not done. Even though you're going through difficulties in your life, he's going to continue and complete it. Well, we see the process of salvation spelled out even further in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 through 30, where it says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined, whom he conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, he also called. Whom he called, and there's that call we're talking about, he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Notice that the process starts and it finishes with God. Well, Paul continues and he says, Brethren, pray for us. You think, man, Paul's an apostle. You know, he's praying for them. But he realized fully that he needed the brothers and sisters to be praying for him because if he's an apostle, can you imagine the challenges that the apostle Paul is going through with the enemy trying to knock him down? Ian Bounds says this. He says, Many persons believe in the efficiency of prayer, but not many pray. 
Prayer is the easiest and the hardest of all things, the simplest and the sublimest, the weakest and the most powerful. Its results lie outside the range of human possibilities. They are limited only by the omnipotence of God. Few Christians have anything but a vague idea of the power of prayer. Fewer still have any experience of that power. Prayer is our most formidable weapon, but the one in which we are the least skilled, the most averse to its use. Prayer is a trade to be learned. Why is praying so difficult? You know, I mean, we can pray occasionally, but to really get into a prayer time, to really get into a schedule of praying, it seems like there's always interruptions that come. Why is it so difficult? Do you realize Satan would love nothing more than for you not to pray? If he can stop you with interruptions from praying, he's, he, he is happy. Samuel Chadwick says this, The one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil. He marks, mocks at our wisdom. But he trembles when we pray. You know, if you struggle with prayer, I, I encourage you to join us at one of our prayer times. We have prayer at 7.30 Sunday morning. We have prayer at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. Times to come together to lift up needs for the Lord. I, I've noticed over the years that the way that the services go really depend upon the prayer time and how the prayer time went because they set the tone for the entire day when it comes time for, for, for the, the worship service of that particular day. And so if you get that chance, I encourage you to go to one of the prayer times and, and get involved in that. Verse 26, he says, greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. Boy, it would sure seem strange in our culture. In fact, Doug, I'm going to come down. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> I, I won't give you that, that holy kiss right now. But in reality, the kissing on the cheek, it was, it, it was something that they did. It was the normal greeting of the day. It was very similar today. When we come together, we shake hands. Or another thing that we do today is we just give each other a quick hug. We give each other an, an embrace saying, we love you. It's good to see you here type thing. So it's not that it was anything weird. There's some parts of the world today that still have the greetings in that way. So Paul says, I, uh, greet the brethren with a holy kiss. And then in verse 27, he says something really strange. He says, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all of the holy brethren. That word I charge you means you need to put this under oath. I'm putting you under oath right now. You're going to read this letter to everyone. And it seems strange that he would come down that hard on the people. You wonder, why would he do that? And I think one thing that we can look at is, is maybe the leadership at that particular time. In fact, it's the only time that that kind of language is used in the New Testament. And I think maybe the leadership at that particular time, uh, there was some issues with, with the people that were there. Uh, Thomas L. Constable says, I charge you, suggests that God would discipline them if they disobeyed. Were there some problems in the church that Paul wanted to get at by having everyone hear his words? Or did he realize that his epistle was written under divine inspiration and was therefore spiritually valuable? Perhaps he had both motives in mind. And I think obedience from the congregational leaders to read Paul's epistle out loud to the entire congregation was critical that the people would get to know the word of God. And this leads me to wonder, is it possible that there was concern that the leaders wouldn't do it and there would be information that would be withheld? I think as we look back over the course of church history, you find out that for many, many years that the congregations weren't allowed to read the word of God. It was only the priests who could read the Word of God. And when people went ahead and they tried to put the Word of God into the vernacular, into the common language of the day, they were martyred. And so for a long time, you had people that they, they, they were confined. They couldn't get the entire Word of God. That's why I'm excited whenever I look out there and I see you guys with your Bibles in hands and you're following along with me. I hope you check out every word that I say because it's really important that you do, that we're on a right track here. But I think the first 27 most likely means that Paul wanted to make sure that all of those individuals who are unruly, all of those individuals who are causing problems got to hear the letter that he was writing to them. And then he ends this letter with these words. He said, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. That word grace means God giving us a free gift that we don't deserve. 
It means unmerited favor. It means something that we don't deserve. God has graciously given it to us. I think the beautiful thing about God's word is that it's a book of grace from beginning to end. And that grace is in Jesus Christ when he left heaven. And he came to this earth to live a sinless life. That he died on the cross for your sins and my sins. That we can find forgiveness and new life in him. Should we pray? Father, thank you for your word today and for this book. And Lord, as we look at all of these things and, and uh, the, the need to be, to be praying people who are thankful to you, Lord, we just thank you and praise you for all that Christ has done for us. I ask right now, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that if there's anyone here who's never received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, that they not leave here without doing that today. There's nothing more important in eternity that they can do. And I just pray that they might pray, pray a prayer like this, realizing that there's no magical formula, but it's the state of the heart. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I repent. I change direction. I change my mind. I ask you, Lord, to come into my heart and my life and to help me be the kind of man, woman, boy, or girl that you desire for me to be. Lord, this day I surrender my life to you. First in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.